This episode and others like it are made possible by the generous support of my patrons on Patreon. If you'd like to help support my channel and get early access to every video, consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash second thought. Let's get this straight. How would it be if the United States were viewed by the rest of the world as interfering with the elections directly of other countries and everybody knew it? What would it be like if we engage in activities that he is engaged in? It diminishes the standing of a country that is desperately trying to make sure it maintains its standing as a major world power. That's part of what makes us special as Americans. Unlike the old empires, we don't make these sacrifices for territory or for resources. We do it because it's right. It's funny. The countries which have spent the greatest amount of time enslaving, invading, overthrowing, and exploiting the rest of the world are for some reason seen as the torchbearers of civilization today. While many powerful and wealthy nations engage in this sort of behavior, none hold a candle to the United States. In this episode, we're going to debunk the myth that the US does not interfere in foreign affairs, and take a brief look at the mountains of evidence that show, contrary to what US leaders would have you believe, this country is the most meddlesome in the world. To give some context for Biden's speech at the beginning of the video, he was talking about Russia's alleged attempts to meddle in US elections. While much of the Russia fear-mongering was, and is, an attempt to deflect blame for America's own problems, we need to realize that most strong nations are always messing with their peers and competitors to their own advantage. Espionage or throwing a wrench in foreign affairs is not some fringe approach to global geopolitical jockeying. It has, for a very long time, been a fairly common method of one nation trying to get ahead of others. Russia does it, the US does it, France, the UK, you name it. It's immature and ahistorical to throw a fit about other nations meddling when your own nation is doing the same thing. It's especially ridiculous if you're the President of the United States, the nation guilty of the most foreign interventions by far. We'll start with U.S. interference in elections specifically. Well, if Special Counsel Robert Mueller continues his probe into Russian meddling into, into the 2016 election, we take a look back at Washington's record of meddling in elections across the globe. By one count, the United States has interfered in more than 80 foreign elections between 1946 and 2000. And that doesn't count U.S.-backed coups and invasions. Since the end of World War II, the United States has tried to influence the outcome of elections in Italy, Iran, Japan, Brazil, Costa Rica, Chile, Uruguay, Italy again, El Salvador, Panama, Nicaragua, Ukraine, Russia, Mongolia, El Salvador again, and Palestine, to name just a few. Each of these instances failed to make the kind of news that Russian meddling is making today. I guess it's different when you're on the receiving end. And you don't have to take my word for it. Here's former CIA director James Woolsey openly admitting our efforts to undermine the democratic process in order to further U.S. interests. Have we ever tried to meddle in other countries' elections? Oh, probably. But uh, it was for the good of the system in order to avoid the communists from taking yeah. over. For example, in Europe, uh, uh, in 47, 48, 49, uh, the Greeks and the Italians, we... We don't do CIA. that now, though. We don't mess around other people's well, elections, Jim. Mm, nom, 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 nom. <laughs> O only for a very good Can cause. Can you do that? Do a Vine video on a former CIA director. Only for a very good cause in okay. the interests of democracy. All right, thanks for being here. You'll notice that he can't even say we're no longer meddling in foreign elections. This should be obvious to anyone keeping up with current events, but it's pretty damning to hear it directly from the organization responsible for many of these crimes. You'll also note that Woolsey made sure to say that we only meddle for very good reasons and in the interest of democracy. Now, it was my understanding that the democratic process meant the people of their respective nations had the right to make their voices heard at the ballot box, free from coercion or interference. If that's the case, then the United States government's definition must be something entirely different. In what world is it in the interest of democracy to have a foreign intelligence agency undermining elections to influence the result? That's like burning a house down and saying you're doing it to prevent fires. Okay, so wait. If the United States isn't actually defending democracy around the world, if we're actively undermining the democratic process, why are we doing it? What's the real reason? 
Well, if you take a look at the history of US activity abroad, it shouldn't be hard to find the answer. Nearly every single foreign intervention by the United States, with very few exceptions, has been in the interest of acquiring resources, expanding our imperial reach and establishing new military footholds, or overthrowing governments that refuse to bend the knee to US superiority, and installing puppet regimes more agreeable to US goals in the region. This may sound uncharitable, but it's objectively true. We have libraries worth of evidence of the imperialist crimes of the United States. I've left some examples in the description. It's not random either. The capitalist powers, especially the US, have very specific targets they try to sabotage. What kind of governments does the US try to undermine? It is always those that have implemented or are beginning to implement left-wing economic policies. The United States corporate-controlled government understands that humane, common-sense, worker-centric policies are incredibly appealing to the average person, including Americans. U.S. leadership does not want to run the risk of a successful, left-wing economy growing large enough to offer the world an alternative to destructive, genocidal capitalism. But trying to influence the outcome of elections will only get you so far. If you really want to throw a wrench in things, you need to take a more aggressive approach. This is where the U.S. really shines. You've probably seen this infographic floating around online. It's a little outdated at this point, and doesn't even include all the US's interventions, but the fact that the United States, the supposed defender of freedom and democracy, has engaged in at least 56 military interventions in Latin America since 1890 is insane. When casting doubt on an election outcome just isn't enough, the imperial powers have some other tricks up their sleeve. The favorites of the United States are fomenting coups, funding right-wing death squads, and sending in the CIA or paramilitary groups to cause as much chaos and disarray as possible. The list is far too long to cover in depth, but let's take a look at just a couple of the more well-known examples. We'll start with Chile. Tuesday, September the 11th. Out of an early autumn sky, two jets launch a deadly attack on a potent symbol of democracy and freedom in a nation's capital. The result is fire, suicide, and ultimately the death or disappearance of over 3,000 people. Shockwaves are felt around the world. This is the story of one day in September. Since the early 1930s, Chile had been a shining example of democracy and political stability in Latin America. All of that came to a screeching halt in September of 1973. Salvador Allende, a physician and socialist politician, had been elected president in September of 1970, making him the first Marxist to hold the office of president in a Latin American liberal democracy. The United States didn't like that. Allende had served his country in various government positions for over 40 years before ascending to the presidency. And as president, his platform included nationalizing key industries, improving and expanding education, and improving the living conditions of the working class. These common sense policies made him quite popular among the Chilean people, though decidedly less popular with the right-wing parties that controlled other parts of the government, and even less popular with the United States, which had begun actively plotting to overthrow the democratically elected Chilean president and install a puppet dictator. These plans came to fruition on September 11th, 1973. The Chilean military, supported and advised by the CIA, laid siege to the presidential palace. Allende vowed he would not leave, and instead broadcast what would become his final speech to his fellow Chileans, an inspiring call to never give up and look towards a brighter future free from oppression. From inside the palace, Allende refused to leave, true to his promise not to surrender the government for which the ordinary people of Chile had voted. He broadcast this last message, then he shot himself. Allende took his own life rather than let the U.S.-backed coup plotters capture him. After the military seized power, General Augusto Pinochet established a military dictatorship, which would remain in place until 1990. 
crippling the Chilean economy and destroying all the progress made by Allende socialist initiatives. You've probably seen right-wingers make references to pushing their political opponents out of helicopters. They're referring to Chile under Pinochet. It was common during that bloody period for the military to kidnap dissidents, take them up in helicopters, and throw them out, typically over the water and usually with their stomachs cut open so that their bodies would sink. At Pinochet's direction, thousands of Chileans were tortured, executed, or disappeared. All of this was the result of the United States and their genocidal commitment to ensuring no economic system could ever offer an alternative to capitalism. Let's look at another example, Nicaragua. After the revolution, during which the socialist Sandinistas overthrew the Somoza dictatorship in 1979, the United States once again set its sights on Latin America. The U.S. had originally intended to work out some kind of agreement with Nicaragua, but when the country chose to side with the global socialist movement and work with Cuba and the Soviet Union instead, the U.S. quickly changed its approach. As with Chile, U.S. leadership was completely unwilling to allow a budding left-wing economy to grow to eventually challenge the myth of capitalist superiority. They feared a socialist movement, a genuinely democratic movement, unlike the facade of democracy we have in the U.S., would inspire revolutions throughout Latin America. In December of 1981, Reagan authorized covert operations in Nicaragua. These operations would eventually include funding, arming, and training what were called the Contras, groups dedicated to overthrowing the new government. Among the equipment provided by the CIA were instruments of torture and assassination, one of the more egregious actions that earned the United States a slap on the wrist for violation of international law was the CIA's production and distribution of a manual titled Psychological Operations in Guerrilla Warfare. This guidebook, which the CIA distributed to their loyal right-wing death squads, encouraged the assassination of certain targets, including non-military personnel like judges, police officers, and government officials. It also encouraged the inciting of riots and shootings which would result in the death of selected members of the Contras themselves, with the aim of turning them into martyrs and thereby building support for the Contra cause. The United States would continue to sow chaos in Nicaragua for years, amassing a death toll of over 50,000 people and destroying the popular democratic movement. These are just two examples from one region. In Latin America alone, the United States has launched at least 56 military interventions in recent memory. And don't make the mistake of assuming that's all in the past. It still happens. The Venezuelan police captured a group of American coup plotters just last year. And as we speak, we're witnessing a surge of right-wing opposition to the democratic election of socialist candidate Pedro Castillo in Peru. It is absolutely guaranteed those factions are working with U.S. intelligence agencies to undermine the democratic process and prevent socialism from gaining any ground. Latin America represents the front lines in the fight to throw off the yoke of capitalism and build a brighter, freer future, without the oppression of the United States or the other imperialist powers. It is essential that Western socialists support these struggles for self-determination. But Latin America isn't the only target. We've also seen decades of coups and attempted nation-building by the U.S. in the Middle East and in Asia. There's a reason the United States is running 24-7 propaganda operations and has over 400 military bases surrounding China, a country that routinely supports growing socialist movements in other countries. So, when U.S. officials claim that we don't meddle in foreign elections, that we do what we do for the sake of defending democracy and freedom, understand that they're lying to you. And they know it. The United States does not defend democracy abroad. We don't even have real democracy at home. American leadership has lied about socialism for over a century. And if you don't believe me, read the CIA's own words on Stalin, saying that the Western conception of communism is wrong, and that the Soviet Union did indeed have collective leadership, as opposed to the strongman dictator myth that American leadership peddles to this day. All of this information is out in the open, you can find it just by searching a few keywords online. The fact that the President of the United States can address the American people and brazenly claim that this country does not meddle in foreign affairs should be insulting to you. Every U.S. administration is counting on the fact that the American citizens will never take the time to educate themselves and deconstruct the imperialist propaganda. Prove them wrong. Read non-Western sources. Talk to people from different countries. Learn actual history. The internet makes all of this easier than it's ever been. 
moving the needle away from genocidal imperialism and capitalist domination and towards egalitarian socialism and true democracy will be a challenge. It will require average people going out of their way to correct false narratives, to educate themselves and those in their circle. But if we want to ensure a livable future, if we want our children and grandchildren to actually experience freedom and democracy, we have to start today. I mentioned at the beginning of this video that this kind of content is made possible by my patrons on Patreon. When I decided to make the shift from general interest stuff to more radical political content, I knew I ran the risk of sinking my channel and losing my ad revenue and sponsors. These days, it's pretty hard to get a sponsor on my videos. I have one reliable one, and they're great. But for the most part, I'm having to rely on the generous support of viewers like you. If you appreciate the work I'm doing, and you're able to chip in even a dollar a month, I would greatly appreciate the support. As a little show of that appreciation, every patron, regardless of donation amount, gets early access to every video, as well as access to our patrons-only Discord server. It's a great place to hang out, chat with other like-minded people, or learn about socialist theory in our book club. I'm also pretty active in the server, so you're always welcome to ping me to ask a question or just say hi. You can find my Patreon, join our growing Discord server, and get early access to every video at patreon.com slash second thought. If you enjoyed this video, consider dropping a like. If you hated it, a thumbs down. You can check out my previous videos by clicking the links on your screen. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week.